Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this online event on Belarus. Our panelists will discuss what the EU can do to respond to the needs of the Belarusian people in these critical times. Today's event is hosted by uh, Petrus Haustevichus, who is the European Parliament uh, Standing Rapporteur on Belarus. And this is co-organized uh, together with uh, Civil Rights Defenders and the uh, Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. My name is Alexander Shudin. I work for the Swiss NGO Civil Rights Defenders, and we're engaged in supporting human rights and civil society in Belarus. Since uh, we have quite a few speakers today, you expect uh, from me a very light moderation. Uh, but at the same time, we will make sure to find time for Q&A. So feel free to write questions on the, here on the YouTube or Facebook uh, chat of the stream. And I will uh, try our best to, to, to get uh, speakers to answer them. Uh, and just as a brief introduction, I want also to um, raise attention on you know, how we are still waiting, of course, for, for the EU to get out of the current deadlock concerning uh, uh, sanctions uh, uh, towards Belarus. But we see at the same time uh, the pressure is growing in different fora. Uh, in particular, yesterday, uh, 17 member states of the OSCE invoked the so-called Moscow mechanism. Uh, in order to establish an expert mission and investigate uh, human rights violations. And uh, now, as we speak, the UN, UN Human Rights Council is holding an urgent debate on Belarus and uh, will hopefully also adopt a strong resolution mandating the High Commissioner for Human Rights to closely monitor the situation in Belarus. I don't think I would have to add much uh, to what then the European Parliament is doing because we'll have Mr. Ostevich uh, covering it. But this is also to show that there is uh, uh, also a strong reaction by the international community. At the same time, it's, of course, there's also an urgent need to support people on the ground. Uh, we will hear today from panelists talking about key sectors, uh, in particular difficult situation, and also hear what can be done to support them, what the international community can do, and of course, in particular, the EU and its member states. But first of all, let me now give the floor to Mr. Austevichus for some uh, introductory remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alexander. Thank you, all panelists uh, who kindly agreed to take part in our today's exchange. Well, Belarus is uh, not just an, an issue for summer. Uh, you can see in uh, autumn, we continue following uh, developing situation, changing situation in Belarus. And for good reason, things just started. I don't think we, we see something uh, already in a final shape uh, or uh, results uh, uh, final, uh, finally achieved. It's very much an uh, involving uh, process. But uh, let me briefly uh, to describe the, uh, this week uh, events probably in, uh, in uh, European Parliament uh, to reflect better uh, our position and uh, um, things we have uh, for the time of being. Indeed, on, uh, on Thursday, the European Parliament voted for, to my knowledge, uh, a very good, uh, clear resolution on situation in Belarus. For the first time among the European institutions, we have recognized Svetlana Tsikhanovska, Tsikhanovskaya as uh, um, president-elect uh, by people, by Bel Belarusian people. And this is a very clear signal that there is no vacuum uh, of uh, leadership um, in Belarus. Svetlana is, uh, let's call it, uh, uh, a man in charge here of, uh, of situation. Uh, trust given from the sides of people should be recognized by all EU institutions and member states in order to see uh, a real dialogue uh, possible in futures, uh, because uh, we shouldn't create any uncertainty in this regard once we are calling for dialogue and OACE or dear office uh, to get involved in establishing this dialogue for transition. Secondly, uh, our resolution is very clearly uh, uh, stated on uh, uh, status of uh, former President Lukashenko. We do not recognize him as uh, legitimate. Um, elections are falsified, which leads us to a very clear conclusion. He is not a legitimate um, leader. He has no right to uh, discuss future of Belarus, even with uh, a big neighbor in, in the East. And thirdly, we asked for uh, sanctions, sanctions which must come as a result of uh, all crimes committed by present regime. And we shouldn't delay um, being uh, 
uh, opening uh, cases uh, amongst those who are responsible. So in brief, I would uh, probably um, uh, describe the policy line of uh, EU, which must be um, based on three S, solidarity, support and sanctions. And all that should come uh, in, um, in the same package at the same time. We should not uh, hesitate, uh, in fact, uh, to, involve, uh, to invoke uh, a strong sanctions regime. Sanctions must be effective. Support must be tangible. That's why we've been speaking even to the EU institutions concerning the additional 50 million distribution and the way it might uh, reach out uh, society, uh, those uh, who suffered from uh, uh, torture, from uh, losing jobs and uh, any positions, not being channeled to the state budget. And finally, of course, solidarity. It must be EU-based solidarity. It can be regional solidarity. We do understand, for example, the uh, tense situation in Mediterranean, uh, the, uh, the present situation between uh, Greece, uh, Cyprus, and Turkey. The same should be extended to our region. And I really don't like at all the signals we receive from uh, diplomatic circles that uh, from time to time, Cyprus is questioning uh, uh, policy line uh, towards uh, Belarus. It's better not. Otherwise, we might question uh, the policy line towards uh, Cyprus and uh, in relationship with uh, Turkey. It would lead nowhere. So that's why timely decisions are of uh, half value and it shouldn't be overlooked. In fact, on Monday, we in, in the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, we are about to approve uh, uh, report and recommendations to the Council and the Commission concerning the uh, policy line on, on Belarus. And I, I think uh, we have to be very clear that uh, there should be a policy change towards Belarus. Uh, uh, present uncertainty or unde undecisiveness of uh, some politicians and institutions, it's a result of uh, previous mistakes, what, what we made. And we have to be frank. Uh, otherwise, we might repeat uh, uh, mistakes in, in, in the future. But of course, uh, practicalities matter. So that's why I'm looking forward very much, uh, colleagues, to your uh, contributions in this regard, uh, sending uh, and collecting excellent ideas, proposals from the ground, and approaching those who are in charge of uh, policy making towards Belarus. Alexander, once again, thank you so much. I'm looking forward for our debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think this uh, theory as the solidarity support sanctions will be coming back uh, during the discussion, of course, with a, a big focus on support. Um, so let me now I'll introduce our first panelist, who is uh, Natalia Yegashevich. She's the director of the Secretariat of the Eastern Partnership, sorry, Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. Uh, and uh, the Civil Society Forum recently carried out a monitoring mission to Belarus. And uh, Natalia will both share some of the findings and recommendations, but also, um, yes, tell us more how to, 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 to better, how the EU can better support civil society. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, MEP Austrievichus and his colleagues for indeed adopting a very good resolution on Belarus yesterday. It's a very good achievement. Uh, it's a good foundation for our further work uh, for all of us. And of course, it's an honor for me to, to speak at this uh, event today. Um, as Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, uh, indeed, we have uh, conducted a monitoring mission focusing on elections and human rights in Belarus during the election days and uh, weeks after. And uh, it was a very uh, useful exercise which produced a number of recommendations with which we are working now with different stakeholders, both uh, the EU institutions and the EU member states. So this format uh, of this monitoring mission, we believe, could be uh, a very useful mechanism for other actors as well and should be adopted and applied in Belarus uh, by more actors, European CSOs, EU member states, European institutions. They can conduct monitoring missions with in cooperation with Belarusian organizations or uh, European CSOs. Of course, it's best done when the mission is actually working in country, but as was in our case, the mission has 
has been working online, but still it has been able to produce very good recommendations. So um, that would be, let's say, my first recommendation to ensure that attention is there, try, try to go, try uh, to monitor the situation in coordination with different actors, with different stakeholders. So we should be really uh, keeping, keeping our eyes very tightly on this. Um, and uh, the monitoring mission, of course, produced a number of recommendations, both of political level and uh, some of them were reflected as in uh, MEP's Austria, uh, welcome remarks, and some of them uh, more on the level of support to population and civil society, and I will mostly focus on those. However, I will, um, let's say, give myself a freedom to uh, have uh, one uh, general remark of uh, more, let's say, a uh, political or strategic um, level, and uh, it is connected to this uh, a review that uh, EU currently is uh, undergoing of uh, EU-Belarus relations. And um, here what is important is to listen uh, to the Belarusian people and, uh, uh, for example, the European Parliament does it very well. And the Belarusian people do not see their future with Lukashenko. So all the strategies that the EU is building now should be by, based on the premise that Lukashenko will not be staying. The Belarusian people will be protesting on the streets until he goes. So that's why all the strategies that are built on, on this premise, I believe, would be very much different if we doubt about uh, the situation. Um, my second point would be about um, avoiding or getting rid of fear by the EU that it might be accused of um, interfering in internal affairs of Belarus. Uh, now we're talking of uh, gross violations of human rights, of uh, um, people tortured. So now we're talking about values and the EU should be very actively uh, defending the values on which it is founded, but also um, the Belarusian authorities who committed to those values in international treaties and also in Eastern Partnership program being part of this program. So now uh, I will go, uh, I will focus more on the support to the population and uh, civil society and believe here uh, from the side of the EU uh, expressing solidarity with Belarusian people at all level levels is extremely necessary both at the level of official, uh, people to people, organizations, professional association to professional association, it's extremely uh, needed. We should not stop with that and we should not underestimate the value of, of such actions. Um, it's important to offer medical rehabilitation, including psychological support in the EU member states to victims uh, who suffered from tortures, uh, bullets, grenades, whatever was used against the peaceful protesters. Uh, some people will need months of intense rehabilitation um, and uh, we're talking about several hundred of people here. So basically it would be uh, very uh, useful if all EU member states will uh, offer such a support to Belarusian population and it is extremely timely to do it now when there is a delay uh, on sanctions and uh, um, let's say in Belarus there might be a feeling of uh, uh, frustration or uh, misunderstanding of why the EU is not acting on this. Um, another thing that should not be forgotten is, of course, subsistence support to those who suffered repressions, those who were laid off for political reasons, those who stepped down themselves because of ethical reasons, political reasons, etc. So. Uh, people of Belarus now are supporting those families, those people with a variety of initiatives. However, we see that uh, demands extends, uh, exceeds greatly the supply. So we hear that volunteer initiatives, for example, online platforms, they do not have enough capacity to provide help as fast as needed. And smaller um, uh, initiatives, uh, um, they step in to help. However, we see that um, more help is needed and what has been done has been impressive in terms of numbers of families that have been helped, that people have been held, helped, but uh, we see on a daily basis repression continues, so more and more people would need such support. Such support. Um, another uh, point is uh, about the visas and borders. So it would be very helpful for Belarusian CSOs if uh, visa application process can be simplified and visa fees and also COVID test fees uh, waive, uh, waived. So uh, currently 
Belarusians have to stay in quarantine for uh, 10 days, for example, when they arrive to Poland. Um, and they have to uh, pay for COVID tests in Lithuania, which costs about 70 euros. So it's not very affordable for all civil society organizations, or they have the option of quarantine for 15 days as well, which is also quite uh, financially burdensome to find uh, the place to stay for those 15 days. And of course, uh, it slows down the work, the crucial work that CSOs are doing now, and many of them have to travel to, uh, to EU member states uh, for work-related purposes. Uh, and to finalize and not to take more than five minutes time uh, allocated for the speakers, um, I would like to say that in spite of um, this new enthusiasm of uh, Belarusian people about civic activism and new self-organization initiatives, uh, the traditional civil society sector is considerably weakened. Uh, it has been weakened by years of um, operating in restrictive environment, and this environment has been further aggravated by a uh, COVID pandemic. The current uh, political crisis strongly affects uh, CSO's operational capacities. The staff is being detained, detained activists threatened, equipment conf confiscated, access to funds uh, further limited, and operational model models made unviable. So the sector needs to be supported to survive the double challenge of COVID and political crisis, uh, to be able to absorb this new wave of enthusiastic volunteers who are willing to help now and to continue building a foundation for new Belarus. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Um, we now just um, move on to the, the next speaker. Uh, and uh, we know that youth and students have been among the main targets of, of the repression. Uh, so we have now next on our list, uh, Maxima Smilta, who's the head of the communication and development unit at the European Human Humanities University. So I'll just give you the floor. And I would like also to extend uh, gratitude to a member of the European Parliament, Patrice Ostrajewicz, who uh, have always been very helpful and uh, su supporting our university during all the years that the university operates in Vilnius. I am representing here at this meeting the Belarusian University in Exile that was forced to move in exile after July 2004 when President Lukashenko of Belarus back then has taken a personal decision to shut down the only private university in Belarus. And it has been thanks to the solidarity, uh, solidarity of more than 15 governments and uh, international organizations, and also thanks to the invitation of Lithuanian government that the university was able to settle in Vilnius, Lithuania, where it still continues to operate, whilst 95% of our students, they are Belarusian citizens. So during the 15 years of operations in exile and universities operating in exile, this is something of oxymoron, this is not natural. There are very few cases of such universities and EHU by far is one of the most vivid examples of this. We have more than uh, 2,500 graduates who have received their bachelor's, master's and doctoral diplomas at EHU and 62% of them they return to Belarus after graduation. And therefore I'd like to stress in these uh, few minutes uh, of speech uh, something what is essential to the curriculum of EHU and what I believe is the, one of the essential drivers and the catalyzators of uh, civic revolt that we see in Belarus nowadays. And this is civic engagement, civic engagement of students and civic engagement of faculty. Uh, starting from September 1st, here in Minsk, where I'm currently located and talking to you, we have witnessed uh, not tens, not dozens, but hundreds and thousands of students who stood up for their rights, who stood up in their fight for freedom, for their dignity, and they continue to do so on a daily basis. There have been uh, vocal examples when at Minsk State Linguistics University, at the Belarusian National Technical University, uh, leadership of these respective universities, including rectors and deans, they were threatening their students that riot police will be used in order to crack down on the peaceful student protests taking place on campus. Uh, video footage from these threats have been disseminated widely across independent media here in Belarus. And this is not just a single occasion, but this is a consistent oppression that university leadership has been conducting against universities of the of, of, of university students that I have just mentioned. We have also seen the brave examples of 
university faculty who were standing up for their students and were protecting them when riot police attempted to detain them. So we see that, uh, as it has been the case in 2004, when Lukashenko uh, decided to shut down EHU, back then the only private university in this country, it was done because of the reason that the university community is the place where independent thought, where critical thinking has been present. And this, in Lukashenko's terms, was not something welcome in this country. So we see that uh, solidarity is an essential tool in making sure that not only people here on the ground in Belarus, they are able to continue uh, the revolt for their dignity and freedoms, but also to let them know that they are not ignored by the rest of the world. And here something very natural comes to mind, Belarusian membership in the so-called Bologna process or the European higher education area. Belarus uh, has been a member of the European higher education area since the year 2015. It has been adopted during the Yerevan ministerial conference with the roadmap that Belarus has failed to implement. Later this year in Rome, there will be a ministerial conference of Bologna process. All ministers of higher education, res responsible for higher education in the countries belonging to Bologna process are, set, are expected to get together. And if uh, the oppression that we see nowadays taking place in Belarus against Belarusian students uh, continues. How can this be possible in the country which declares itself to be a member of the Bologna process and in a way stands, uh, is considered equal by the rest of the European academic community by the virtue of its belonging to the European higher education area? This remains a mystery not only for the community of EHU but for those academics, for those students, ac student activists who are witnessing uh, the crackdown on independent thought in this country. This concerns not only universities that are oppressed by the regime, but also the Academy of Sciences. There are numerous reports when young scholars of the Belarusian National Academy of Sciences who stood up for their rights, who are going out in the streets and protesting against the brutality uh, of the regime, they are also oppressed in various means and various ways. There has been also the report that one of the youngest and brightest Belarusian historians, Mikola Volko, who is focused on the history of fortification, who is, by the way, the graduate of EHU, has been detained on Sunday. And exactly thanks to the solidarity and independent attention and inter international attention to his case, he was released two days later. Uh, therefore, the question of Belarus recognition as equal part of the Bologna process is something what we as Europe, we as the West, I believe, should take care of and uh, should let uh, Belarusian regime know that the oppression against academic community is intolerable in the 21st century. Otherwise, we're giving a very wrong signal. We are, first and foremost, we're giving a very wrong signal to higher education communities at our homes. It is also the question to uh, universities in our respective countries. What sorts of bilateral corporations do they have with those universities here in Belarus that remain oppressing their own students? How tolerable is it? Lastly, I want to give you a very brief example that has happened just yesterday uh, in the evening. Two students of the European Humanities University last evening were detained here in Minsk. I'm talking about Maria Rabkova, who is fourth year student of international law and European Union law, and her husband, who is also a student of EHU. They're both part-time students. It means they're living permanently in Belarus, but studying at the Belarusian University in exile in Vilnius. And they were detained for a very simple reason. Maria is a volunteer for one of the most vivid Belarusian human rights center, Vyasna, or spelled in English as Spring 96. She has been a volunteer involved in numerous projects of this human rights center, and now she is arrested. It's not yet clear where exactly is she held, and there is a criminal uh, case which is uh, prepared against her. Her husband is expected to get uh, invited, in a way, today for an interrogation, and we see that people get detained here not because of their affiliation to one another university. Instead, they get detained because of their civic education, which, come, which comes in a natural part of their civic duty, of their perception, what does it mean to be citizen? And therefore, in our opinion, as the only Belarusian university that operates in environment of free thought and academic freedoms, civic engagement is central to higher education, especially in the fields of humanities and social sciences. And therefore, if we continue supporting those institutions of higher learning that are oppressing their students in Belarus, probably we're not really following in line with the values that European Union is promoting. Therefore, 
On behalf of the European Humanities University, I would like to welcome the yesterday's resolution of the European Parliament. It has a very firm language and it gives a very good signal to Belarusians. And it's important for us, uh, for, the, uh, for those representing the European Union also that uh, it's not only the actions of individual member states that we have seen in the recent weeks that have been providing direct support to Belarusians, but also that the European Union as a community communicates itself to Belarusians and so that hearts and minds of Belarusians know well that the European Union stands behind them. And I'm quite confident that we, this will be the case after uh, yesterday's adoption of the resolution. Lastly, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we are risking to discredit first our own higher education milieu, our own environment of higher education, if we do not take care of this question of how tolerable is Belarusian membership in the Bologna process in the context of oppression that Belarusian regime is doing against its own students. Thank you very much for inviting. Thank you, Maximus. I, I think that your, 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 your presentation and your ask were really clear. So it's, 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 really, it's, it's really key. And also the, the yesterday's uh, arrest of the, the Vyazna volunteer is another uh, worrying signal. And we ho really hope that international pressure will also help um, you know, pushing the authorities to release her. Um, next is uh, Victoria Fedorova, the chairperson of the NGO Legal Initiative. Uh, Victoria will uh, focus on the current situation of lawyers and also how both like lawyers and the victims they assist uh, struggling in the situation and how they can find more support uh, internationally. Please, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak and for all your support um, to Belarusian people and to Belarusian civil society. And of course, um, uh, yesterday's detention of Maria Rabkova was a very bad signal for civil society organizations because uh, we believe that the real reason of detention is to intimidate human rights defenders and to stop their work. Maria was engaging in uh, uh, court proceedings monitoring and also with torture victims documentation. So we believe that the real reason is to stop our work. Talking about in Belarus still the same. Um, first of all, uh, Belarusian Bar Association are not uh, independent and uh, in practice are subordinate Ministry of Justice and the state doesn't comply with the requirements to reform this bar association system, guaranteeing independence and self-government. I think, I think we have an issue with Victoria's connection. Um, I will try to fix it. She's back. I will try to fix it maybe in the meantime, maybe if... Uh, um, Oleg would be ready to take the floor since we don't have that much time. Uh, just uh, uh, to briefly introduce uh, you, I mean, uh, Oleg Podolinsky is the International Secretary of the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions. Uh, of course, I mean, we all are aware that uh, the, the trade unions and workers are also under uh, really big pressure, also very much linked to the attempts of strikes in the uh, recent weeks. Um, so. See if Victoria is back, but yes, uh, please, Oleg, the floor is yours. And then we'll get back to you, Victoria, afterwards, okay? okay. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome Mr. Petrus Aust Austrevichus, member of European Parliament and the distinguished representatives of international experts and Belarusian civil society. So dear friends, uh, the independent units which I represent as well as uh, for all the citizens of Belarus who are fighting against tyranny and total neglect of law in the country. It is extremely important to be aware that they are not alone in, in their struggle. That they are supported across the world and in the countries of the European Union in particular. On the other hand, it is also important that the top officials of Belarusian regime members of election commissions and all those who falsified the elections, as well as the KGB men, police and security forces, prosecutors, judges, 
most reactionary directors of state companies and educational institutions who actively participated in suppressing peaceful pro protests and strikes must remember that the road to Europe forever will be closed to them and their family members. The doors to educational establishments of Europe will be closed to them and their member families. The bank accounts will be blocked as well as possibilities of employment in Europe. The most notorious of them will be put on the international wanted list as criminals who have committed crimes against humanity. Today, legislation in Belarus uh, does not work. It exists in law, but it does not apply in practice. Legal acts are grossly violated by the, pres by the president himself, who has appropriated the right to appoint himself as president of the country, ignoring opinion of the, of the people. Therefore, company workers in, and employees have to resort to informal ways of protecting their rights, and uh, that is to go on political strike. Currently, the workers of the largest in Belarus, uh, Belarus Kali Mining and Potash Processing Company in Soligorsk, went on political strike. At other large companies, the creation of strike committees is either in process or strikes are already underway. The regime gave the command to start arresting the leaders of strike committees and putting them on trial for attempts to overthrow the government, firing them from work, putting them on blacklists, depriving them and their family members of any income and material support. Today, at least 10 leaders of strike committees have uh, already have been arrested and convicted by the court. The workers' leaders now found themselves in an extremely difficult situation. It is important that not only they, but all the protesters who became victims of repressions could be aware that in case of urgent need, they might count on solidarity support not only in their own country, but also outside it, receiving temporary shelter and work medical treatment and education for their children in their EU neighboring countries. The Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions called on members of the official trade unions to withdraw from these unions totally controlled by Lukashenko regime. Despite threats from the authorities and state company directors, members of the pro-government trade unions nevertheless joined the mass protest actions against fraud, fraudulent elections and violence and began leaving the official unions and joining independent unions. Naturally, such process takes time and needs courage, as the workers have been forcibly held in the so-called state unions for decades. They still have no idea of what real trade unions should be what they should do and how they should protect the interests of workers. The former members of the pro-government unions need a real trade union education and training from rank and file members to trade union leaders. Special attention should be paid to women and youth. The BKDP and its affiliates are ready to organize and run such training courses in cooperation with the European trade unions. Dear friends, we believe that a long-lasting solidarity support from all over the world, including Europe and the joint, persistent and multilateral pressure on dictatorship regime can lead the Belarusian people to democratic changes in the country. And the yes, this resolution of the European Parliament on Belarus is a good start for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alec. Uh, we will now, in the meantime, try to, to get back to uh, Victoria. Um, really sorry we, we lost you. It uh, happens from time to time. But we will add the last thing I think we heard from you after you mentioned, of course, that the Bar Association was not independent 
and then we started losing you. So if you're going to get to go back to that, please, Victoria. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that today the work of lawyers in political cases is practically impossible because lawyers are not allowed to visit detainees at police stations and also in uh, uh, isolation center for offenders. Court proceedings are held by uh, video communications and the lawyers are physically unable to communicate with clients. And in principle, all these uh, trial proceedings are far from principle of independence and uh, fairness because uh, from the part of persecution, uh, police officers in masks and balaclavas testify, hiding their faces and also uh, introduce themselves with uh, fake names. And uh, the cases of torture victims are uh, of particular concern because uh, unfortunately to, to date, not a single criminal case uh, on the facts of torture has been initiated. Moreover, the investigative committee initiates criminal cases against victims of torture uh, for uh, mass riots and try to intimidate them uh, to drop charges. Uh, and it can be stated, as Alec mentioned, uh, that the uh, law uh, no longer works in Belarus. And of course, uh, the culmination of such situation was uh, the detention uh, of two lawyers, uh, Maxim Znak and Ilya Saleh. Uh, they are suspected uh, of publicly calling for action uh, to harm national security. Uh, as you may know, Maxim Znak is a board mo member of Coordination Council. Uh, both lawyers uh, are now in jail. And this morning, the court hearings about uh, uh, detention of Maxim Znak uh, was to be held, but uh, the hearings were postponed without any explanation. And it should be noted that uh, leadership from Bar Association, instead of defending the lawyers and their rights uh, before the state bodies, on the contrary, uh, hints to lawyers uh, about possible repressions. Uh, the head of Bar Association, Victor Chaiches, uh, noted that uh, uh, lawyers can be uh, victims of repressions. Uh, he said it. Um, uh, uh, after uh, about 100 of lawyers publicly uh, say, say uh, their position about uh, violations of rights of people and about uh, Im uh, impossible visits to prisons. Uh, on the positive side, I would like to uh, note the solidarity of the lawyers who are not afraid to publicly express their uh, support uh, to their detained colleagues. Uh, about 100 lawyers recorded a video demanding the release of uh, the detainees, uh, uh, release uh, Maxim Znak and Ilya Saleh. And today these lawyers came to court to give their personal guarantee uh, for Maxim Znak uh, to be released. And this situation is very important. Uh, uh, yeah, what is really important is support uh, uh, from EU bar uh, associations, support for the Belarusian colleagues, and also clear demands to our authorities to stop uh, repressions and to give possibility to lawyers to just do their work. And of course, for victims, what is now very crucial is easy access to EU. Uh, when uh, people uh, have these uh, threats and uh, possible repressions. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Uh, in the meantime, let me also just remind you that if you have questions for the panelists, uh, feel free to write them on the YouTube or Facebook. Uh, uh, stream. Uh, uh, we still have two speakers, uh, so let's let's move on. Next one is uh, Maxim Federal, who's uh, actually a medical doctor who's usually based in the US, but has been in the last six months in Belarus trying to organize medical help during protests. Uh, Maxim Maxim is also a member of the Physicians for Human Rights. Please, Maxim, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me for this uh, meeting. I would like to extend my gratitude to European Union who came up with this uh, resolution recently, which shows the uh, significant, significant support of uh, Belarusian uh, people. And 
I'll be brief. Uh, previous speakers has covered the situation in Belarus quite uh, extensively. Uh, uh, we all know uh, about all those examples of uh, uh, severe human rights violations, about torture, about beating, about right police uh, actions. Uh, I just would like to concentrate on the healthcare uh, uh, problems which exist in Belarus currently. Uh, uh, those problems actually have the roots not only from August, uh, those issues started with the COVID pandemic, uh, when, as everybody aware, the uh, Belarus, uh, Belarus government completely refused the, uh, to recognize the seriousness of the problems and uh, ended up to being completely uh, unprepared for, uh, for, for the uh, epidemic. Um, uh, the, uh, they used the uh, false uh, statistics uh, to uh, artificial lower the number of people who suffered from COVID. And uh, the hospitals were not actually prepared for the epidemic. We didn't have enough uh, protective equipment. Uh, the physicians were not prepared for uh, uh, to fight the uh, infection. And uh, actually, we ended up with a significant number of sick people. And uh, the recent release of information from European Union has shown that the number of deaths uh, over the past month of 2020 uh, uh, exceed by five, but, but approximately 5,000 people, uh, the uh, death rate from the previous year, which kind of speaks for itself. So that uh, created the situation that uh, uh, physician uh, doctor society in Belarus has uh, lost the trust to the official uh, Ministry of Health. And now what we can observe is a complete detachment of uh, uh, official health care system um, from the actual needs of uh, Belarus society. Um, uh, the, uh, like the, one of the examples of, of, is the uh, former uh, Minister of Health, uh, Karanik, who uh, refused uh, to recognize the seriousness of, of the problems and recently during the protest uh, did not provide the support to the healthcare workers of uh, Belarus. Also, we know that a lot of physicians who participated in the protest has been arrested and detained. Uh, some of them were released, some of them still in uh, jail. Uh, some of them are uh, quite uh, recognizable uh, physicians in the country, uh, like uh, pediatric oncologists or urologists, uh, which definitely impacts the healthcare. Um, I just, I, I would like to kind of streamline that healthcare in Belarus at the moment is very outdated and conservative, and the educational system of our physicians is also very outdated. Um, uh, what our students, medical students and young physicians are completely lacking as the uh, access to the uh, modern European American uh, healthcare uh, educational standards. And uh, most of uh, physicians who graduate from the medical school, they uh, don't have enough uh, educational uh, capabilities uh, to further uh, function as independent and uh, uh, competent physicians. So some of them are uh, looking for the opportunities uh, to study in Europe or study in the United States, but there is no uh, support from the government for that. Actually, government is resisting, uh, claiming that uh, physicians are uh, being educated uh, um, by the uh, country, by the government, and they do not have the right to leave the country. Uh, so I think one of the main uh, support European Union can uh, provide to uh, uh, healthcare sector of the Republic of Belarus is to support those educational initiatives like uh, uh, participating in the Congress, uh, participating into educational activities. Um, I personally believe, and this is the opinion of my colleagues, that uh, support of the official healthcare sector of Belarus uh, would not be uh, fruitful. All this money, if you'll try to pour money into that sector, will just go uh, to the government. So I think that uh, uh, if European Union uh, indeed uh, serious about the support of the physicians of Belarus, we should support the uh, private initiatives uh, and mostly concentrate on education. Uh, some of the uh, examples of uh, self-education of our doctors are uh, most recent initiatives, uh, uh, which has been created just by the physicians, uh, like by cardio, by COVID, when uh, we try to help to uh, uh, create a system uh, uh, 
uh, of fighting the COVID epidemic uh, to train people how to provide the uh, basic and advanced life support. Uh, as I mentioned before, our physicians are lacking those uh, knowledge and uh, the official education system is not providing us with that. Um, um, uh, one of the uh, very uh, encouraging events which is happening right now, uh, the physicians of Belarus are trying to create an independent uh, union, uh, independent from the official uh, Ministry of Health. Uh, it's about 6,000 people right now, and we are exchanging information. We are trying to come up with ideas how to make our um, medical system better, but we are very restricted. Uh, uh, we are afraid of oppression, we are afraid of persecution, we are trying to hide our identity, but we are working on this. We are working on the creating of independent uh, union of the healthcare. Uh, workers of the Republic of Belarus, and uh, we uh, need a support from uh, our colleagues from Europe. We need support from uh, our friends from European Union, um, and the most recent initiatives of European Union has clearly shown the support, and we are very thankful for that because we are now isolated in our country. Um, we really need uh, to know that uh, our neighbors are supporting us. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I hope I can answer all for the questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Maxim, and especially for describing uh, the situation, your initiatives, and also the clear demand for uh, support to the private uh, initiative and not uh, to the uh, health public official healthcare sector. Um, finally, uh, our last speaker is uh, Timur Onika. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, Stimu is a senior program uh, manager at the European Endowment for Democracy and since EED supports a wide range of actors including those that cannot be supported by uh, EU instruments we would like to hear more about what you do, the challenges and the possible suggestions to make international support more effective. Thank me. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm uh, happy to speak and um, you know, the previous speakers have uh, underlined uh, quite a few priorities and uh, which are inspiring for us, but um, also which are reconfirming, meaning that uh, I, I've heard many things that we've uh, uh, done proactively. As you've mentioned, um, I work for the European Endowment for Democracy, which is uh, set up by the EU member states to provide support to new and non-traditional um, form of um, civic activism and media. And that is specifically that we're seeing uh, that you know demand for uh, for uh, this is happening. And um, here, um, I think we we should stress that the um, uh, there's a lot of need to uh, for for support for the um, current transformations in Belarus, and uh, and that is specifically uh, because of the. Um, um, there's been a grand awakening of uh, civil society, civic and political both, um, happening uh, during the spring-summer. And uh, uh, there are major shifts and um, new actors, major shifts in what should be done. Um, one important assumption is that um, uh, this change is uh, structural. It's not just, uh, we're not speaking about uh, uh, protests only. We're not speaking about people just uh, wanting to be in the streets. Uh, we're speaking about um, the fact that um, the um, um, uh, new swathes of uh, civil so of civil society have uh, become active. Uh, previously dormant groups. Um, um, we, I mean, cynically speaking, we can call complacent citizenry uh, people um, that have been fine for a long while, uh, and now they're not. Um, What's happening now is uh, also the um, a complete realignment of social and political values and redefinition of concept of citizenship uh, in Belarus. People are different. They're no longer, they have shown uh, during the pandemic uh, crisis uh, and the civic response, they they started to um, self-organize um, uh, where uh, because the state failed uh, to, to address the challenges, they've self-organized and um, because of the disinformation that was happening, people have got um, a taste for uh, independent information and for media, uh, independent media. Um, 
then these groups have politicized in the aftermath of the protests. And uh, what's happening now is that uh, what's happening actually in the streets of uh, Minsk and um, um, online and offline is not um, per se a uh, protest, but it's a um, deformation of wider civic movement uh, to defend citizens' rights. Uh, middle classes in the street, people who have money and have skills from from the business environment, they know uh, how to organize and uh, they uh, they are eager to donate uh, to support um, uh, um, civil society. But uh, here, um, some things that the um, uh, that, that uh, some uh, a long term change that uh, should be uh, should be supported here, um, coming uh, stemming directly from uh, from uh, from this development is to. Um, uh, support society to become more active and empower it more. And by that, I mean that in the um, medium and long run, um, but starting as of today, uh, the, we should support uh, the development of a cultural philanthropy. We, uh, we've seen how impressively Belarusians are supporting um, are supporting one-time campaigns or, or donating money to help the victims. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're seeing that uh, Belarusians under, start understanding the need of uh, the major infrastructure of democratization, and that, that is uh, independent media, uh, political part, opposition parties, political parties, or civil society organizations. They should be supporting those um, also, not only one-time campaigns, but uh, um, there must be a, uh, also a, um, a, a more profound shift in, in the philanthropy mentality of Belarusians, and that can be uh, definitely supported by exchanges, by um, uh, civil society should promote uh, this idea that uh, if you are ready to donate, um, and you can, and if you're re ready to donate money for one-time campaign or for a parcel for a uh, um, detainee, um, in the street, uh, you should be uh, also supporting those who work on long term, pay their uh, maybe salary or uh, uh, pay for the office of the newspaper or uh, buy it uh, more frequently, um, allow it to uh, survive on business revenues. That's, uh, that's I think, uh, um, some major, um, um, uh, major task for both civil society and for uh, new pro-democracy forces. Um, Another important, um, um, another important um, priority is to uh, generally empower and support this um, uh, the civil society and society at large to participate in the uh, transformation and in the um, um, or to support processes of inclusive change. Uh, are we talk? We're, we can talk about uh, many things here. Uh, transform, uh, transmission of power from the current regime to the new, to something new. Or, uh, but I think uh, what we realistically can can uh, talk about now is that um, there needs to be EU support and uh, uh, um, international support as well as uh, support from everywhere for uh, public dialogue for uh, discussing various visions of Belarus and uh, genuinely inclusive. Uh, uh, generally, generally inclusive uh, change, uh, generally inclusive visions, and by that uh, the um, um, international and uh, community and society should support um, the um, well processes uh, or access of citizens, uh, access of this new um, uh, citizens, active citizens to the to the process of this public discussion, but also. Um, uh, a, a major uh, importance is um, to support the access of citizens to information. Um, there's a lot of disinformation now happening about uh, what change, what's happening in the streets, or what needs to be done. Um, who's supporting what? Uh, the, what is the role of donor, of international donors? Uh, um, disinformation has to be uh, combated, and the alternative information uh, needs to be in place. Now, um, otherwise, I fully agree with um, uh, basically um, uh, Natalia. Even from the beginning, uh, mentioned um, the priorities that the uh, uh, international community um, have. Now, uh, in the short term, um, uh, indeed, uh, we should support those repressed. We should support that the media organizations can um, uh, provide alternative information. We should support uh, digital and online activists who uh, have completely broken the uh, monopoly of uh, the regime on uh, uh, on information and um, um, uh, through um, Telegram channels, alternative ways of delivery of uh, this uh, alternative information. That that should go on. And uh, definitely, uh, it's a big priority. Um, um, otherwise, uh, 
support to independent media, um, digital security, support for rehabilitation of journalists, support for replacement of um, um, stolen and um, stolen, uh, uh, damaged and uh, 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 confiscated equipment. Um, then uh, we should not. Uh, we should also uh, remember that there's a huge demand now for. Uh, media for for independent information, but uh, me, the media just cannot afford working. Uh, that's not only because of the repression uh, that's current currently happening, but the um, consequences of the COVID crisis. So uh, independent media cannot access the market; doesn't have market uh, revenues from the media market. Um, that um, uh, that is something that the international community should uh, should be considering in the long run. Um, support uh, for this uh, new groups and self-organizing uh, promote their access to political and civic processes um, support for platform of discussion um, uh, discussion on political debate uh, inside belarus um, inclusive spaces for uh, discussions between civil society and the, the um, uh, uh, insiders of the um, government now also uh, is important um, um, solidarity here um, has been mentioned. Uh, um, uh, international solidarity uh, is a key for uh, reinforcing the views of um, Belarusian society that they should continue with the transformation um, and building their resilience to, to further um, participate in, in democratic processes. That's uh, what I can say in general. Uh, of course, it, it, it would be difficult for me now to uh, give details of uh, uh, EED support. We are unfortunately still working in a country that criminalizes uh, human rights activity and um, um, activity in uh, uh, civic and um, uh, political uh, spheres, which is unapproved by the state. And uh, uh, that is um, generally depressing but uh, uh finally just to say that um repression uh, imminently will not succeed here because the what is happening in belarus now is not a protest that can be quelled if you um imprison a, a couple of leaders or a couple of public personalities it's a wide social transformation that's taken place uh, um, uh, people who have not been active before are there and it's many of them um, and um, uh, all the all the support possible uh, should be encouraged. Uh, the European Union should connect with society directly. If not, uh, if um, if not with the um, uh, current government, then uh, then directly with the civil society. And definitely the recommendations by uh, the labor um, um, related civil society and by the doctors, by uh, uh, the media are here uh, very important. Um, <laughs> Well, just to Thank you. in in the uh, my my last five minutes, we should not also forget about those who exited the uh, state media and the state structures. They need to uh, have reinforcement that there's life on the good side, and uh, they shouldn't be afraid. And that's a major task for us. Very difficult to do, but um, um, something that's possible. Fully agree. Thank you, Timur. And since we really have just a few minutes left, I think this this worked quite well as concluding remarks. But I also want to leave maybe opportunity to others who would maybe say have just a few couple of uh, sentences as conclusion or comment or anything you didn't have the chance to say before, please. It is. Alexander, may I? Yes, please. Well, as, as far as I remember, we, we have received one written question, I mean, on, uh, on the situation, asking, uh, is there any difference in opinion among, among the member states uh, towards the situation in Belarus? Yes, there is, but uh, I hope um, even bigger member states uh, being uh, more distantly located from, uh, from Belarus will understand and will hear the voice of people from the streets. Um, I hope, I mean, this, this goes into the right direction, although we, we have to admit that uh, the certain difference and sometimes hesitation, I mean, to run according to the speed of people uh, as politicians uh, always uh, must do, uh, is not really a, a present feature. Well, I, I do thank you um, all um, panelists. Uh, you know, I mean, it was for me very important just to recognize, I mean, not to um, uh, register as uh, a high level of civic activism, but to notice this uh, societal transformation process, self-organization, self-defense, uh, um, coming together. This is something what we didn't see in Belarus for 
for many, many years. So that's why uh, I take a, a lot of very good uh, suggestions from your side and conclusions uh, on uh, on a possible extra su uh, support package uh, spending uh, on Belarus with one principle. We shouldn't waste money since we can lose political credibility in the eyes of Belarusian people. And this message probably should be sent to EU institutions as soon as possible and as strong as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think that, that was definitely uh, clear. And uh, anybody else would like to uh, add something or... Yes, please, Natalia. Yes, I would like to add maybe um, on another aspect that has not been mentioned, it's the trade between the EU member states and uh, Belarus. So I think there is an important uh, connection and important leverage here. First of all, uh, quite some number of EU companies are they, uh, de uh, doing business in Belarus, so they definitely should be uh, sending letters to the companies they are dealing with uh, appealing to them to respect human rights and uh, all other uh, freedoms. And uh, in case when their enterprises, state-owned or private, that support the regime, that they continue the persecution of workers, uh, I mean, they should kind of consider changing the providers. And maybe even such a recommendation can be done from the level of the EU, that EU can recommend the EU member states to uh, connect with their private companies doing business in Belarus. So I think this will, will be extremely helpful to and, and give another, let's say, push uh, in this process. And another aspect is, of course, the equipment that has been used uh, to um, fight with the protesters that uh, has been coming uh, from, uh, we, we learned from Canada, for example, and uh, the uh, equipment has been used to stop internet uh, from, from the US company. And now we have seen uh, reports from several sources that a uh, Czech company might have been providing grenades uh, and uh, the, the new uh, supply might have been uh, loaded today or yesterday. So this has to be verified, but this should not be happening. Thank you. Indeed, let's remember there's still an enormous embargo, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, definitely agree with you. Um, anybody else would just say a few more comments or should we, we, we already passed the time. So if, if nobody has anything to add, I'm just uh, going to really thank you all speakers. Uh, and uh, hosts and organizers, and of course, uh, all those who watch us today, really for, for, for listening to us. Uh, we really got a good overview and the recommendations uh, from the different sectors covering a really wide range of, uh, of, of themes. Uh, and really it's important, of course, that we, you, uh, everybody uh, make sure to keep, to keep the attention high uh, again, um, We've seen uh, now things are moving in uh, some international fora, but at different levels, it's really important uh, to continue. And uh, again, thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Thank you.